second about my experiences because just because I'm biased by my experiences, okay? I can't help it. It's where I was when. And I'm 53 years old now, but to give you a little bit <clears throat> about my background, um, besides almost getting killed in my first company that I told you all about, um, I have um, always been uh, in software engineering. Was fascinated with data uh, from an early stage, but I'm not as smart as, as you all, so we always uh, hired people that we could help us define pattern recognition, basically. And early on, I was in IBM, or I was in software engineering, and, um, and really I got in sales. I kind of have that, that personality to try to solve problems. But I was with IBM for 12 years. Uh, I co-opted with them when I was at Auburn. And then I had a crazy idea. I had an entrepreneurial seizure. Does everybody know what entrepreneur, where, where it really came from, where the word entrepreneur came from? Entra means enter, pre, before, neural, you think. So I entered before I thought. And I quit a very good job at IBM um, to go start my own company. And that was, uh, I was working for IBM in, in Atlanta and Montgomery, Alabama. And I moved up here. And the guys and girls that started Sal Trust Bank funded my little company and asked me to move up here, a guy named Wallace Malone and Roy Gilbert. So I was a 32-year-old guy, had twins that had, um, were four months old. I had a good job and now I had left. But ended up, um, IBM gave me a piece of technology that we had created for Federal Express when I was at IBM. They owned it. And long story short, it was in 1996. It was the first web-based testing tool. So what's your name again? You don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Back in 1996, for you to be able to go to the Internet, get a mouse, click on a radio button, and grade a test was unbelievable. Because now you could practice tests, see what your weak areas were, attach the tutorials. So anyway, I'd done that for Federal Express. thought it was a pretty cool deal. IBM ended up letting me leave IBM. They funded my company with the South Trust folks. I took that tool. We later got a patent on web-based testing. And so in 2000, my investor said, you're not very good at running a company, but uh, you've built a pretty interesting product. We had a patent on web-based testing, so no more Scantrons, right, to collect data. So I was always about data collection. <clears throat> and anyway, got a patent. They introduced me to an investment banker. I didn't know what investment banking was, and that's what I am now. I didn't know what it was when I was 32. We went on a road show, and we sold our, our company to a publicly traded company called Houghton Mifflin. That time, came back to Birmingham, worked for them a year, had 50 employees in, in, uh, in uh, South. Uh, well, basically, it was on 20th Street. You know where Zydeco is? My building was where that we owned the build, that, that health building next to it. It's, it's Gateway Health now, right next to Zydeco. That was virtual learning technologies. Sold that business. 50 of my employees went to work for them. I worked for them a year and then became, um, um, a, I started a VC model incubator. So basically, a venture capital model incubator Worked with Susan Madlock down at the Innovation Depot, helped companies raise money and do stuff. So I wanted you to know my background. Then I was on the board of Founders Investment Banking, and it was investment banking, Nick. We had to change it to advisors because the state of Alabama changed a, a rule. If you have banking, bank, any derivation of bank in your name, you have to have a bank charter. Well, we're licensed by the Security and Exchange Commission and FINRA, and so they made us change our name. We're like, well, man, that's crazy. But we had to change our name about uh, three years ago. So I started, uh, moved over to Founders with my partner about 12 years ago. And since then, my whole joy in life is to, is to figure out the value of private companies. And we've been, um, is, is this where I'm running this from? So I'll just go, Clay, right? Okay, I'm running from that one, sorry. So basically, that's a little bit about me, and for the last um, 12 or 13 years, we have done, uh, in my practice, so we've done about uh, 75 software deals. And when I say software deals, and this is where the data comes in, basically, we've helped owners of software companies. You might, so most of them are all over the country, but like we did shift, so the store, or the group here in town, we raised their capital um, before they sold to Target. Uh, several companies around here, uh, the recent ones around here, Director Point, I don't know if anybody's familiar with them. Uh, Shagan that owned Therapy, uh, Theranest, Shagan was my client. So um, a genius that's, you know, we saw him a year and three months ago, and he's grown the company. It's public now. He's grown the company $352 million. It was $16 million a year and a half ago in Birmingham, Alabama. 
So we use data to underwrite companies <clears throat> to show what they're worth. So here's where y'all come in. I'm very fascinated. I'm not a quant. I have a lot of them that are working for me that are unbelievable at, at finding data and patterns in data to prove that a company is something special. So I want this to be useful for y'all. The worst thing for me is if we walk out of here, where's my phone? I'll make sure I don't go over time. And y'all can, you know, go like this, quit, stop, whatever, but I want to make this interesting. But I want this to be useful, okay? And we'll chat about this in the numbers around business. And here's all I'll say. Do y'all know the number one question any business lady or man wants to know? The number one question, if you ask the data the question, the number one, it's survey after survey. We, we do this with private business owners. You know the number one, a private company wants to know about their private company? What? Bingo. How much is my business worth? If you're a publicly traded company, how hard is it to learn what your company's worth? Click at the button. It's called market cap, number of shares, outstanding price shares. gives you market cap. If you're a private company, you don't have a clue. And, y'all, we find out most of the time there are a lot of owners of businesses. They don't know what their company's worth. Sometimes they're, a lot of times, software entrepreneurs that I work with think their company's worth a lot more than it is. There's a lot of people that are just driving around in an F-150 truck that's beat up. They think their business, as my papa called it, that's my business. They think it, oh, it ain't worth that much, and it's worth $100 million. They don't know it. So what I want to sh show you and demonstrate tonight as a banker, I love my, my people to come show you the operational and unit economic models. Y'all would love that, the pivot table. I want to show what goes behind it and get your thoughts on it. What values a private company and the data? And I want to get your thoughts because y'all are so bright. Y'all going to teach me tonight. How would you approach this as a data scientist to help get this data? Okay? Because sometimes that's the hardest deal. <clears throat> Enterprise value, which is valuation of a company. Is my company worth $5 million, $10 million? 100 million is based on risk and that's what a lot of you are in the business of right you're underwriting risk <clears throat> the higher your perceived risk in your company duh here's captain obvious here the lower your value the lower your per your perceived risk the higher the value a private company and you know, I'm going to tell you how to make a lot of money. if you can do this for business owners or your company you work with as a private company, if you're a public company, if you can figure out what correlates to moving your stock price besides just macro things, this, this is fascinating. And, it, and it's in the numbers. I mean, it is in the numbers if you can find this out. But it takes very, very bright people to figure it out. <clears throat> you will um, always have a lot of work to do and a lot of value. So how can data prove that one company has lower risk over another? Even if you watch Shark Tank, and that's the VC side, right, venture capital, versus I work with companies that are a little bigger, that are ongoing. You know, most of them are making money, but some of them are not. They're growing really fast. They're not making money, but they're worth a fortune. Why? Because of a thing called risk-adjusted future cash flow. I can see through the numbers that this thing can scale, and that's the power to value. So how can you prove lower risk? How can, you, uh, how can your data prove high growth potential? There's only two things people want that invest in private companies, low risk and high growth. How can you prove this? And then what are the patterns in your data that can prove it? <clears throat> that's, that's the key. So is it okay if we talk about this is what we're going into tonight? I keep thinking I have a ticker, a uh, clicker, a oh, ticker symbol. Um, <clears throat> we're going to come back to this because I'm going to ask some questions. <clears throat> I've got the qualitative factors and some quantitative factors. But to start with, I'm going to clip through these very quickly, and I want you all to tell me how you think you could get data to prove these different factors that determine the value of a private company, okay? And I think you all might come up with some things uh, that, that I haven't even thought of. And here's the point. You have to track it, prove it, and mitigate the risk as a goal. That's what builds the case for enterprise value to investment bankers, to private equity groups or to strategic buyers. So how do you build a case as a data scientist 
to take that case and say, my distributor, my software company, my manufacturer, my insurance company is worth more than the cohort. How do you, how do you prove that? Is, is this an okay topic? Okay, if you can do this, you will make a lot of money. You will be an expert witness. <clears throat> the number of times our people, and we can't really do this because it takes so much time. If you want to make money as a data scientist, be an expert witness in valuation of companies. Do you know how much that's needed? A lot more than blood specialists for crimes and stuff. Why do you think it's so important for courts in the United States of America to understand the true value of a company? What do you think's going on, typically, that there's a court case? Divorces. Divorces. Secondly, it's partner divorces. And one, the person, you know, in a divorce, Somebody wants the company to be valued very, very low. Oh, this company's not worth anything. It's cash. It's EBITDA. Does everybody know what EBITDA is? And, and this is not shame. If y'all start talking about quant stuff, I gotta know it. How many of y'all know what EBITDA is? Okay, <clears throat> about half of you. That's got it. And depreciation and amortization. EBITDA is a true cash flow that a business spits out, okay? Before your taxes, your depreciation, your debt, service. It's the true cash flow. That's what an investment banker like me wants to know. Okay, so um, that's what it is. And I want it to be low if I want to keep the business. I want to show my business isn't worth anything. My wife wants to show it's worth $100 million if we're getting a divorce. There is so much need for this, and partners the same thing, because uh, you have to have the data. And you're talking to a jury about what this private company's worth. And so the data becomes absolutely critical, and you have to keep it very, very simple as data scientist for the consumer to get it. So we're going to go through these reasons very quickly, and I'm going to hand it out. I can get used to it. And y'all are going to say again, thank you, Captain Obvious, for coming and telling us these things are important. But here's what we're going to talk about, the data side of it. What I usually presenting to are families that own businesses, and they got their family sitting in here, mama and daddy, two sons, a daughter, Daughter's married to an OBGYN. She's not working in the business. The older son's, hey, is it okay if some of this is confidential too? Because I mean, we're this is confidential, okay? I'm not going to say name. The older son, seriously, I can't tell you how many times this is our situation. The older son <clears throat> is working in the business, doing a fantastic job. The daughter doesn't really want the business. Her, she's doing fine. She's raising kids. She don't want it. She wants her distributions because the company's making five, six, seven million dollars a year. The younger son, let's say. He's in rehab, but he's still got a third of that business. And the mom's saying, I want to protect Thanksgiving. Don't you keep this careful. And the dad's like, oh, my goodness, you know, I don't know what to do because I got one kid that was running the business pretty good, but I'm scared to give up control because both most people that have built high-end private companies, guess what they are? Control freaks. <clears throat> it's the reason they built a great company. So we're in a room with them trying to decide what to do with this and bring in outside investors maybe to buy that out. So here's, so I'm usually talking to those people, so I kind of keep this simple. Y'all, um, SAT score on the math um, is a lot higher than most. So, you know, <clears throat> so here they are. We'll talk about this from a, give me one more of these, <clears throat> from a data perspective and how <clears throat> y'all would help us prove this. So very quickly, the first one is, and, and I've written these and you don't have this, okay? You're not an investment grade company if you don't have these things. So I'm asking y'all, how would we prove it? Not just for the C-suite as Nick, Nick and I talked about. And I'm going to show you some data, but I want to hear from y'all. So first of all, listen y'all, here's a secret. This will make you a fortune. If you ever decide to go in business for yourself, now I'm going to hit some of you consultants too, okay? Don't ever go into a business that doesn't have recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is worth a fortune, y'all, because it de-risks this thing. If you have good retention, and we're going to talk about these numbers and the relationships, what's the difference for all you smart folks in recurring and reoccurring revenue? What's the difference in reoccurring and recurring? Recurring <clears throat> happens on a periodic basis. My Netflix subscription. My mosquito squad, okay? Reoccurring is something that could happen more than once, right? Somebody comes to my grocery store more than once. That's not recurring. It's reoccurring, okay? Recurring is the most valuable revenue known to woman and man. 
You got it. Reoccurring, that's the reason the insurance business is so awesome. You buy a premium, you pay for it every month. Nobody wants to use it. I don't want to die. I don't want to wreck my car. I just want to give you, but I give you my premium every month. What a business to be in, protected life. That is awesome. Um, and we got to have it, right? The, the other kind of revenue in a big bucket is one-time revenue. Y'all, if you have a business that's one-time, I can tell you all this. If you're like a construction company, you can get rich being a construction company, but not by selling your business. You get rich by making a lot of money and investing it in real estate. If you're a subscription-based software company that we call SaaS, software as a service, or you're, man, you're an MSP, managed service provider, you can annuitize those as a worth, worth a fortune. So you have to be able to show that. That is the biggest driver of value. And I want to ask you all in a minute, how would you compare with data? Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask you all this. Again, I'll, I'll get down whenever y'all want me to. We'll get down early if we need to. How would you help me determine if, if, if you could help me in a company that has project-based revenue show that that revenue moves from one time to just reoccurring, it could be worth a lot more. If you could show me by data that that construction company that builds houses, I think it's one time, but you show me through the patterns that over the lifetime a consumer builds many houses with that, or they have such a good brand, I might start rating that revenue stream for a lot more money. We see families leaving millions for little companies and millions of dollars on the table because they don't have the data to show that their revenue is reoccurring. They think it's one time. <clears throat> so this is an example from a sale KKR. Anybody ever heard of KKR? If you heard of Barbarians at the Gate, that was their book on private equity, a sales their technology group. I have a friend out there. I sent him my buddy's company, his blood report. These are the revenue centers that my friend had in his little software company. Revenue center one through six. Y'all can't see this. This is such a killer example. And this was back in 2014 when we sold this gentleman's company, a college dropout from Knoxville, Tennessee, for $50 million. Okay? I sent him the blood. He's worth now, he's bought 48 companies owned by Insight uh, Venture Partners. He's worth three and a half billion dollars because he's bought, the, he was a college dropout from Tennessee. This was his numbers when I met him. $4.8 million run rate. Y'all know what a run rate is? Revenue run rate. Means if you timed his last quarter's um, revenue times four. That was his run rate. This company gave him an enterprise value of four times revenue for that revenue stream. The last revenue stream, revenue stream six, he was doing about 900000 They gave him a multiple, you see this, of revenue, not EBITDA. Typically, companies are priced on a multiple of your profit, of your EBITDA, cash flows. So they gave him 902000 valuation for that. They added all up this and said, your valuation is $35 million. That's called a sum of the parts revenue. What I'm showing you is all revenue isn't created equal. How can you prove for a business owner or yourself that your revenue is not one time, move it to reoccurring, it's better, move it to recurring like Netflix and you're worth a fortune. People can't figure out, why do these companies trade for so much, these little businesses? It's because of recurring revenue. Shipped, their number one competitor, Instacart out in California. Kind of strong, they were doing pretty good valuation. Bill Smith. I was in, he was in my office walking around the table three and a half years ago. I got an idea to deliver groceries. I'm going to deliver groceries. I'm like, and Bill's been very successful. Drop out, didn't go to college, dropped out of high school. Two companies, he's already sold to publicly traded companies. He was 28 years old, three and a half years ago, had this idea of shipped. You know what he said? I'm going to sell subscriptions. You're going to have to subscribe. You're going to have to pay. When he started, it was like $150 a year to be a member. And membership has its privileges. You had to be a member to be able to subscribe. That right there made him stickier. His subscription-based fees is why Target wanted him so bad. Because if somebody's subscribing to you, what does that mean? If I'm just buying your services once in a while, for, but, but what if I'm a subscriber? I'll be back, just like that. So that's the first number. We can go quickly through the other ones. How would you prove, let me give you a, a, a one-time, a consulting business. CTS. Anybody ever heard of computer technology? Okay, that was a company I invested in. Sanjay, Larry, my dearest friends. 
they had a project-based software engineering business. So you go out, you do a project, then you're, you're done. How, how do you think, <clears throat> let me just give you this. That kind of business trades for four times profit, four, four and a half times last year's profit, if everything else is really good. What if you wanted to double that? How could you turn CTS into not just do a big project for Southern Company or Regions Bank and QA project, then you're done? How could you turn that into recurring revenue? Minimal maintenance. What if you do QA and you got a large protective life, which was one of our customers? They don't want their developers working on maintenance. They want them working on new development. What if you could go do QA, I mean, I mean maintenance contracts for your applications that y'all have, Eli and all the applications we've done. That's recurring revenue. Y'all, now you're trading a multiple of revenue, not profit. Typically, I'd be like 19 or 20 times profit instead of four times. Y'all, this means a boatload of money. You have to help your folks. The way data helps here, figure out how to find data patterns where you can turn your services into recurring revenue. Never, never start a business that doesn't have recurring revenue. If it pays you a bunch of money, that's fine, but invest in something else like we talked about. Second thing, your company size and growth rate. As, as quants in data, data is only worth anything in the business I'm in relative to other data. If your company is not growing at a certain rate, you're never going to get a good investment. If you ever see VCs or anybody in a company, you've got to be growing. What happens to a publicly traded company if it flatlines? Stock goes like this. Well, organic growth gets very tough, you know, internally when you become a big company. When you're a small company, the law of large numbers is not working against you, right? So if IBM grows 6%, that looks like it's good. Small company, Shagan was growing 200% a month, you know, and that's awesome. Growth is relative, though, to others in your cohort. How fast are other insurance companies growing? Life is y'all. And everything's relative. My dad was a preacher, and he said, never compare yourself to anybody. The Bible says don't compare yourself. Why? Because you're either going to be inferior or feel superior, and both of those are wrong. You need to be comfortable with who you are and who you were created to be. If you're in business, you have to compare yourself against your cohort. So as quants, I would encourage you. I'm sorry I call y'all. I mean, I, I, I want to be y'all. I want to be data scientists, okay? Really smart people because the data is what everybody wants. Nobody wants slick graphs. They want proof, period. And proof only comes through math, okay? So you've got to show your growth rate, and your growth rate's got to be outsized. You've got to show it as a, as, as your industry, and then you got to show it as your market. What happens, and I want to ask you this, how would you go about, if y'all came out and said, I want to hire you as a consultant, I've got a company, this is the third reason, where you investment grade a company. I want to know that you are growing faster than your market. Why? If there's a new business in Birmingham, let's say Forge, the guy that was Forge, where'd he go, man? He didn't like the topic. Okay. Now, let's, let's take another business that comes into Birmingham, pest control. How do I know that this company I'm looking at is an excellent company when it comes to growth? Are you growing faster than the market's growing? If your business is not, in Birmingham, is not growing as fast as the pest service control termite, whatever, you are not a good company because it means other people are taking market share from you. So how would you prove that a company you're valuing and you're going to be an expert witness for is growing faster? I'm curious where y'all think you would get the data faster than other companies in the insurance business or whatever business. How, where, where would you go to get that data and how would you assess it? Okay, but, but, but I got to know how fast the market's growing in the market I serve, if it's Birmingham or if it's national or international, how do I know what the, does everybody know what TAM stands for? Total addressable market. I got to know the total addressable market, and I got to know that I'm growing faster than it is. Because if I'm not, somebody else is gaining market share. How would y'all find that out? It's funny. I ask this all the time, and people are like, yeah, 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 pest control, sorry.
Bingo. I don't have a marker. I have a marker. Okay, what's your first name again? Yeah. Kevin. Okay, I'm, I'm going to hold where Kevin is. Anybody else got another thing? So number of new holes, people, and people aren't, did you hear what you said? They're not shopping. I mean, once they get pest control, guess what? The retention's pretty high. Some things retention's not high, subscription. I'll switch in a New York minute. If you, thank you if you can give me a better deal. Okay, so you're on it, okay? What, what's your... Okay, and what would you learn from those reviews about? Like, for example, one thing that the the I think you're spot on. Both of y'all. This is a question we ask new analysts that come work for us. We'll give them like how many headlights, if you're a manufacturer of, of bulbs and headlights, what's the total addressable market in the U.S.? And we see, they have to walk through, how would you figure that out? How would you get the data? So on this, get, you you got to you gotta find the ultimate driver who needs this. You go, Kevin also said, just the number of new ho of homes won't really say it. It's the, it's the additive new homes, because the homes that are already in place probably already have an embedded person. The reviews, you're off the charts. How many of y'all know what an NPS is? It's the only number you need to know as an investment banker if a company is going to grow. And I'm going to show you, Harvard School of Business, guy wrote an article on this 10 years ago, Bain Consulting bought it, which was uh, Mitt Romney bought the net promoter score theory, and then McKinsey Consulting is going around the country making a fortune on it, and it's so simple. That's one of the things. But y'all are both right. It's reviews, and it's the ability to go look at new home construction, and then you figure out the TAM, how many homes are here, and what socioeconomic level of people have pest control, right? Because not every home is going to get pest control, certain socioeconomic. And then you look at the commercial side as well. How do you know how big you are related Terminex to look, look, looky, here comes Cookie? How, how do I figure out now which one of those is controlling a certain market? So, so easy if you're publicly traded. But a lot of these companies are pri private companies. They don't know what they're worth. How, how would I go about figuring out who has the most market share? Great point. What else could you estimate? If you went on LinkedIn, you might could find their number of pest control people. You look at ratios in the industry, how many houses or commercial can one pest control person do? I can tell you pretty quickly what their, what their market share is. You've got to prove this. As bankers, we show this all the time. And, y'all, if I can show you're growing faster than every other competitor in your market, you're going to get a premium valuation because it means you're doing something better. Now, we've got to find out what that something is, and that's what we'll get to. So good job. Now, <clears throat> market share, we just talked about that. Y'all, if you don't have over 10% market share, I tell every private company, you need to lower your geography. So I'm an investment bank. We've got 22 bankers, 7 researchers and administrative folks. I could say, I'm the largest investment bank in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, so what? I mean, there's two of us here, right? Two of us that do what we do. Well, I'm the largest in Alabama, which I am, but Alabama got two investment banks. I'm, I mean, the kind we are. I mean, there's a couple that do bonds and stuff. So that's, but it sounds great, right? But if I start getting broader, I get really, really small. You've got to always make sure you have 10% market share in order to drive value because any investor or buyer wants to see you showing up. The second you get higher than 10%, you can broaden your market. The other way you can do this is this, and I encourage this even with big companies. Founders, I run the tech practice. I am the second, like listen to this, I'm defining this, the second most volume SaaS Vertical SaaS, not horizontal SaaS, like Salesforce, uh, software that sells to all. Vertical SaaS, like Theranest that's selling to therapists. Ministry brands that's selling to churches. I'm the second most volume banker, vertical SaaS, securities license, in the United States of companies between the size of 20 million 
and 100 million. You see what I'm doing? I'm continuing to define that to where I show up. I'm second. When could I be first? Well, my top, the competitor that beats me nationally is better 50 million to 100 million. I'm better 25 million to 50. I'm the top banker of vertical SaaS in the world, in the U.S. from 25 to 50. Y'all, this, if you, you've got to get the company down to this level with the data to show that you're differentiated. So market share is important. I gave one thing here. <clears throat> this was actually a company here in town. Uh, David told me I could tell you all this. Have you heard of David Brassville? He's the most prolific software engineer in Birmingham, Alabama. Bill's a new one. David's an older one. He sold four companies to publicly traded companies. We sold his Trinova system. Everybody was looking. He was a small business, y'all. He's doing like, and I can tell this, it's about six and a half million of recurring revenue a year. Nobody, all these big banking software companies said, that's little. David, you're too small. You're not on my radar screen. David and his quants went and they did a market segmentation. And they made this up. This is not in the banking industry this way. He made it up. Small community banks, less than 75 million in assets. The medium banks are between 75 million and 200 million. The large community banks are greater than 200 million. He started showing the prospect universe, the market share segment, the total size. Came over here at the end. Trinovus, that little bitty company, basically has a huge market share in the large community bank sector for this little compliance software. Let me tell you this, y'all. We did an auction. Confidential auction, we went out to the market. People bid on this company, couldn't get the attention of anybody. That number right there, 19%, he's in all these banks, this foreign company called Timonos, that is one of the largest core providers of banking software in the world. They don't have a US install base though. They have install base everywhere in the country. They got our little book, they saw that number. They don't have, they didn't have any five years ago, uh, banking customers in the U.S. of their big system that cost a lot of money. David's system was about $1,000 a month. <clears throat> they saw that 19% market share. They offered a price that was crazy. Y'all, it was, for this little company, it was three times as much as the people in the U.S. Why? Because he owned 19% of this market share that they couldn't get a, they couldn't get a sales call in there because they didn't know how to sell in the U.S. They bought him because of that market share. Because that relative size, they said, we could go hire all these salespeople, never get that. David's already got all these customers in that segment. So you've got to do market segmentation and let the data speak uh, to something that's valuable. There's another example of a, of a managed service provider in New York. They would have never got on anybody's radar screen. But as we started digging into the data, we found, they didn't even know this. We found out. They were one of the top MSPs in the country for charter schools, and they were only in New York City. But guess what? Guess who has more charter schools than anybody in the U.S.? New York City. They had gotten in all the So we could go out to the market saying, this company, because of the data, is the single biggest charter school MSP in the United States of America. We got billion-dollar public companies to get excited about this little bitty $8 million MSP because they were so concentrated in New York City and charter schools. Y'all, this looks like it's, it's nothing. It's like this is, this is common sense. I, I can't tell you the number of people that don't figure out the jewel in their company because they're special. And it's special relative to your cohort. Okay, that was another one. All right, here's a question. How can I use data? You'll never sell your business if your management team is dysfunctional. You'll get a terrible valuation because people bet on the jockey, not the horse. I have seen for the first time in my life, Nick, this is so exciting, the last three years in the banking business, finance and business, buyers are giving an extra multiple, okay? So let's say you're trading at eight times your profitability and you're making $2 million a year. They'll give you another $2 million. If you're making $10 million, another $20 million, another $10 million. If you can prove you have a different culture. How would you all use data? Everybody I see says, oh, Zane, you ought to see the culture of my company. It's unbelievable. We have these, everybody, I said, really, that's awesome. Tell me about it. It's just so wonderful. Where's the data? And they get, they start fumbling. How would you prove 
that a company and you're in, it has to be industry because different industries have different joy factors, right? Different stress. How would you use the data? What data would you need from me as a business owner to show, to demonstrate that my culture, and, and they go, y'all get this one, my culture is better so that a buyer says, it sure is, I'm going to pay you more because they want the talent. We just sold a company to Amazon two years ago. It was an aqua hire. You know what an aqua hire is? Acquisition hire. They bought this company because there were 17 software engineers that grew up together. They didn't want to work for Amazon. They liked their business. They weren't making that much money, but they had a translation piece of software that fit in what y'all were putting on the printer there. And um, Amazon bought them for their culture because those guys and girls sat in one room that worked together, and they said, we'll give you whatever you want. And guess what they all wanted? A lot of money. They didn't, it was so funny. At the end of the day, they called me and said, Dan, we're not sure we're going to do this deal. I'm like, what are you talking about? Amazon's about to buy you. Can I talk to your girlfriend or your they're all young or your wife? And I mean, I promise you, you might want to sell. They said, well, we've got a problem. And what is it? We, uh, we want to ask for something else. And we were about to close the deal, y'all, with Amazon. And I was saying, <laughs> you know, and I said, I was afraid they were going to ask for another $10 million. Small business, but, but typically people will pay for aqua hires a million dollars an engineer or product manager just for your team. If the people will stay with them, then they'll pay you for your intellectual property. So we had a good price. I thought, oh, no, they're going to negotiate. Amazon's going to get mad. We were about to close. So we got a problem. We all had a meeting. We're going to have to ask for something else. I said, okay, what is it? I'll call. We all want three monitors on our desktop, three monitors, the biggest ones. We're going to send you a configuration. I was like, <clears throat> I said, okay, I think Amazon did it. I called them and said, yeah, we'll handle that. So I think it was like $22,000. We got them to bed. And they are happy. Boy, they're happy. Um, so how, 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 what data are you going to show you're going to use to do this? Okay. Get more specific on that. You didn't. Okay, why? You're on to something. Why, why did they miss? They won't know the truth. If they said, if they said, if you have a lot of, and y'all, uh, y'all not going to throw me in jail, right? Don't take me to court. I'm talking about the way businesses work. Sick days. If you got a lot of sick days, it tells me people get anxiety. They don't want to come to work. They don't really like what they do. They don't like the people they work with. It's sick days, y'all. So you get the sick days against how long you've, you've been, your, how long you've been there. Um, also, watch this. If you never fire anybody, they say you're in a good culture. You know why? If you're all A players, and, you know, the way we grade people, I don't know how you do this, Vaughn, but, you know, A, B, and C players. If every company says everybody on my team is an A player, you're lying. So if you don't fire C's and B's every now and then and show me how you did that, you have a terrible culture. I'll tell you what, if you're a super company, and we're all, of course, in this room, we're all the A-plus players, right? So you know, you've never known anybody that's a B or C player. What happens if the culture you're in lets C players stay around? And gone. The A's are leaving. If you've got a real team, and I'm an Auburn guy, but I have to respect Nick Saban yeah, because he's good. Um, you don't let C players do if you love your people because your A players are getting sacked. So if you don't fire, you are not a good culture. They're watching that. They're looking at your retention. They're looking at your sick days. In, anybody else got any other data? Do you have a good culture? Come on. You're on it. Everything. Because you're not an inclusive culture to recruit talent if you're just, we hired this kind of person. You're going to limit yourself to the best and the brightest. So this data, I'm seeing human resource data used like crazy, and I'll show you one um, picture. Thank you, man. Okay, I'm going to show you a picture that uh, just, I just um, saw um, in a roundtable I was in with 100 CEOs, um, and it has a little joy factor of, of what this costs. Also, I would encourage this. Do your net promoter score, we'll talk about that in a minute, own your people. Nobody buys a company now until they see a survey. And they play like it's just your company doing the survey, but really your company's selling, and they want to see a blinded copy of this one question. How likely are you, Zane, 
to recommend Founders Advisors as a place for your friend or family member to work? That's the question, y'all. And as data scientists, if you can apply that question to the business, it's going to tell me what I'm looking for. The one word I'm looking for in a culture, the number one adjective, you know what it is? That everybody, all the investors, what? Engagement, which proves health. Everybody wants to know, do you have a healthy culture? They will pay a fortune for it. If you don't, they're going to run like the plague. If they'll think, oh, they buy businesses and they fire people. No, they buy businesses because of the people. So HR, if you're dysfunctional, you're never going to do it. Find ways to find that data to show that. And the relationship matrices I have seen analysts do for culture, fascinating. Fascinating. And I would encourage you all to keep thinking about that. And in my own company, I think all the time about, you know, do, do we have, hey, thank you for helping me. Oh, we're, are, we, are we, is it coming back? Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Look at y'all. So that's, that's that one on the data. And here's uh, one of the studies that a private equity group uses like crazy. Tell me if y'all believe this. Y'all, this is people that buy companies, private companies, the best buyers in the world. You ought to use this at Vaco. I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. hundred of their CEOs, this was, uh, this was a sell KKR as well. I was sitting in the back of the room when they discussed this. Roundtable said 50% of the time people regret hiring folks. 50% of the time. Now, I don't know about how many of y'all have hired somebody in your life in here. Okay. Have you ever hired anybody crazy, Kevin? And now we're not talking about you. We're not. <laughs> hey, but, no. We got some cray cray in the room here. I'm, I'm not. No, I've hired crazy people. I shouldn't have asked that question. It's like. No. Er, no. <laughs> There's crazy people. And 50% of all hiring decisions exist that we hired the wrong person. But look at this. Tangible cost. These are private equity groups that invest to make money. 14, it costs them 14 times the salary for employees with a base of under 100K if you make the wrong hire. This is how important culture is. 28 times their salary for somebody between 100 and 250K in comp. Y'all? This was not an HR group, a staffing group, a, a, a somebody out there recruiting, wanting to recruit my people. This is a private equity group that says, we have got to get this right. Therefore, if you build a culture where they see 30, 40, 50, 20, like Shagan did, amazing engineers that love working together, it, it's, it's worth a fortune. Show the data around culture. It matters. Okay, if you can't show that you have a barrier to entry your company's not worth a dime. Let's talk about a moat. Warren Buffett, one of my favorite investors, had a friend that went to his um, Omaha, Nebraska um, deal where he and his partner, Charlie Munger, that do Berkshire Hathaway, richest guy in the world, sitting there, had about 900 people in the room. They're doing their review of Berkshire Hathaway once a year in Omaha, Investor Day. My friend called me from there and said, you ain't going to believe what I just saw. In the middle of the day, they had been talking about defensible moats. Warren Buffett said, I only invest in companies that have defensible moats, moats around their, biz their castle with piranha and crocodile in it, their business that's to protect their business. You've got to have a barrier to entry or anybody can get in your business and put you out of business. You're not worth a dime. If I can come in and do it, you you're not worth a dime. The guy came up and said, hey, Warren, walked up, Q&A, walked in the middle of the aisle, had a mic there. I've been hearing you and Charlie talk all day about defensible moats and barriers to entry. I own a family business with my dad. How do I build a barrier to entry? Warren looked over. So what David Hobbs told him, but Charlie said, I got this. He moved my, I said, how do I build a barrier to entry? He said, damn if I know, that's the reason I purchase companies that have them. This is money. How do you show that you have a barrier of entry that cannot be easily copied. So where would you get the data? Now, say we're underwriting a company. What we do is we don't underwrite lives. We underwrite companies, and we take them to the institutional private equity market. How do we prove through data that my pest control company has a barrier to entry, and therefore it's worth more money? Competitive advantage. Because everybody says, I got a competitive advantage, Zane. My business is better. Okay, prove it. How do you prove competitive advantage? Very interesting.
Okay, and you're on to something, Nick. I'm going to see if anybody can get this. Y'all, it's the definition of competitive advantage. I've had MBA student after MBA student. They can't figure this out. You're, you're, you're getting the, the space, the geography. If, if you're a quarry and you're the right place, the, the right supply chain, that absolutely gives unbelievable barrier to entry. Geography, how close you are. how much, But it's going to show up one place. Shows up here. Okay, let me give you more. It's going to show up in your financials. If you'd let me take your blood, if I could see your financial, I could tell you right now de facto truth if your company has a competitive advantage. If I could look at one margin, anybody know what it would be? You got to work hard to find this as a, as a data scientist to get it true. Here's what it is, I'm going to tell you. Gross margin. Let me tell you this. Gross margin, you all know if you look at an income statement, you got your revenue, you got your cost of goods sold, that's your gross margin. Revenue minus cost of goods sold. Then you got your SGNA, then you got your EBITDA. Y'all, if you can build your product or service for a less cost than your competitors at the same quality, that proves you have a competitive advantage. If you can sell your product at a higher price than your competitors, it proves you have a barrier to entry. You have a secret sauce. You're doing something better, doing it faster, doing it cheaper, using technology, have better employees. Does everybody get that? If your gross margin is higher than your cohort, this is why private equity pays a fortune. And on Shark Tank, they don't ever show this. They need to because these are some of the stuff. I want to know their gross margin. You can have a company losing money that is worth an absolute fortune if their gross margin's high, why? In their SGNA selling, they might be doing a lot of marketing, right? But their cost, their gross margin is 80%. All their competitors are 70%. One day, when that company starts getting market share, they're going to be worth a fortune because they're spitting off cash like crazy. Next time somebody tells you you have a competitive advantage, say, I want to look at your gross margin compared to your market. So that's it, and it will show you absolutely unequivocally um, in the data, in the blood. So there's fleeting barriers to entries. There's strong ones. We'll talk about those later. Sales and marketing. Data scientists usually don't like talking about sales and marketing with me. We have all these analysts. We come and we say, we've got to show this company's better at sales and marketing. Why does sales and marketing prove value? How good you are at sales and marketing? Why does that show you're going to throw off so much more cash flow? It has to do with this thing right here. Anybody know what that is? A sales funnel. Y'all, whoever you are and whatever you're doing, it's all about the velocity of your sales funnel. When did I first get a message by rep, by web ad, by brand ad? When did I first get the message to a potential customer? How long did it take from when they actually purchased? The velocity of your sales funnel compared to your competitors Proves everything. Mm. They're not doing it. Great question. Number one, and this is going to sound bad. I believe in CRMs, customer relationship management systems, Salesforce and all that, but guess what? They're one of the least adhered to enterprise systems in the market today. Billing, all that, that's here too. So to your point, Nick, people are not putting this data in, okay? You have to go literally interview salespeople, get their forecasts, or get your web page traffic if you're selling the e-commerce site. When's the first time somebody came? to my site, when did they buy? You have to literally go and manufacture this data because it is so dirty. We tell people never go to the market, never do an auction for your private company until you have got this absolutely locked and loaded. A lot of salespeople need to be fired because they're not, they're not driving the velocity of the funnel. Competitors that drive the funnel do it with our next one, brand. If I know your brand, I don't even look sometimes. Now, I'm, I'm older. Now, now, watch this. If you're over 40, you're more brand conscious in certain areas because I trust that, right? I say, I bought that forever. I'll do it. Millennials and youngers, guess what? 
they almost distrust the big brands. They're not going to buy a Coke product, even their sports drink. They want that new little kombucha. They're not going to buy Anheuser-Busch. They're going to buy that IPA and that little liar. You know, my buddy that owned convenience stores, they did a study. He said, you got to know this, man. We've been videoing everybody coming in and see stores, convenience stores. Something's changed. First time in history, Zane. I'm like, what? He said, we keep all these videos and we track these kids. They're still coming in convenience stores a lot because very nice convenience because they eat healthy stuff too. People your age, Zane, have always walked in. Anybody over 40? They get their gas, walk in, get a piece of candy, get a bag of chips, get a beer, get whatever. I pick it up and I go buy it. Guess what they've seen the first time in history in the data of C-Store buyers? Millennials pick something up. They, on average, set it down three times. Somebody my age, pick it up, give me them M&Ms. Somebody, they pick it up, they read the label, they set it down. They pick up, on average, three. My age, it ain't even an average over, it's once. Pick it up, I buy it. Isn't that weird? So they've got to look at that funnel, the C-Store sales funnel of speed, even from when I get it. It's not, point, it's, it's not like it used to be. Got to have that data, got to get it. And let me show you what a data scientist did. I was preaching on this. I was saying, y'all suck, you're terrible. He said, what about this? I let him give me a picture of this, y'all. This was his sales funnel. I'm like, dude, I am in love. I ain't supposed to like guys, but I love you. This is unbelievable. He had labeled it the sales engine. He had so gotten the data. Now, the good news about his was it was, a, it was something he could get leads on the Internet. Y'all, you got to look at this infographic sometime. This was a basic company selling mortgage, um, a, a kind of mortgage insurance, really. And he was looking at when they first came on his website, how many white papers they read, engagement with the website. It would come, did they ever click on his video, of his TV ad, you know, all these gears, how many opens, profiles, clicks, forms, you know, page views. And then and only then did it ever get a client manager to call. This, my friends, is worth a fortune, and it takes time and energy. And, Nick, that's a clean funnel, brother. And the way they were tracking this was unbelievable, every open. So I would encourage you, whatever company you work with or if you're a consultant, if you want to find where the, where the pickup is, where the dirty room is, it is in your sales and marketing function. And can I, take, can I be really ugly? I, I see this all the time because we value companies. If you've got an industrial company, not a B2C or like protective, you got a lot of inefficiency in sales and marketing because typically there's a lot of egos in there. A lot of egos. They're about their ego and they're about fuzzy. They're, they're fuzzy. I hate to say this. Some of them are fuzzy thinkers. They don't, you got to get them to go um, to the data. A couple more customer diversification. I think you all know this. If you only have a few customers, you're in big trouble. But this is compared to your industry. What if you're a defense contractor? And I say, well, I'm going to compare you to this less than low trucker. It, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be crazy. And the data we're seeing on customer diversification, the work, this is where I love one of our analysts that builds a model. They build an Excel model, and I can't cuss, but it's called a BAS. Y'all know what a BAS is, a big-ass spreadsheet. And, I mean, this sucker is huge, and it's all these inputs, and they're coming in, seeing how all these relate together. Customer diversification is everything. Not all customers are created equal. A new customer, their revenue is typically valued at 1.25 times what an old customer is. You know why? Why would the data, why would a new customer be more important to a buyer? The old customers, if they've been with you a while, are good. Why would a new customer, a new onboarding, a new subscription be very powerful to a buyer? What? Yeah, they're friends. Yep, somebody recommended them. Word of mouth, it's the net promoter score, and it shows your value proposition is still fresh. If you start going down on your new onboards, something's wrong with your product mix, your product market fit. That's, this data will show very quickly you've got, you've got a disease. Competitive margin, we talk about brand and category strength. How do you measure brand? Y'all, listen, I'm just talking about money opportunities. The marketing companies are driving healthcare insurance, but the new data science hires are coming from marketing companies because it is a science, right? It's data. It's a science. How can you show brand matters and what it's worth? 
everybody's a publisher, everybody's a producer today with the iPhone. You have got, you have got to be able to measure your brand strength. How do you measure brand strength? How's my brand of founder and advisors compared to Hula Hand Loki? How do I compare that? It's an emotional test. You get in clients that know both our brands or prospects in the market, and you say, how do you feel about founders? And that's the word, feel. You've got to give them a pain score. As a data scientist, you've got to give them a one to five. How do you feel about founders? How do you feel about Hula Hand Loki? Use of IP, there's a way to do that, but I want to go to this one. Most of y'all knew, how many of y'all knew what the net promoter score is? Okay, y'all, as a data scientist, y'all created this. It was worth a fortune. Look how simple this is, y'all. There is no such thing anymore as a customer satisfaction survey. No such thing. It is just this, because it's the one mathematical number you need to know if you're going to grow. If there's a restaurant that comes into this city, I can tell you within two months, once they get their employees down, if it's going to be successful or not because there's an NPS cohort, Net Promoter Score, for every type of restaurant. A, a quick serve restaurant, like a McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, a Brass Rail, or a Fleming's. Here's what it is. You ask your customers on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend me to a friend or colleague? You take the percentage of your detractors, which are somebody that says zero to six, I would never recommend Zane. You take sevens and eights, you throw them out. Nines and tens are your promoters. If then you subtract, you take 60, if you t ask 100 people, 60 promoters, 30 passives, 10 detractors, you subtract your promoters from your detractors, throw out your passives, your net promoters of 50. Anybody know what Apple's net promoter score is? Changes, they take it all the time. Right now, I think it's 57. If you're over a 50, you're unbelievable. How about Disney? Walt Disney World, 62. If you're, if you're not tracking your Net promoter score, is, if there's one thing every company in the world needs to do, it is this. If you get ready to somebody sell their business and they don't have this score, if they don't have three years of it, longitudinal data showing you're improving, you're not going to sell your business. And this just really started happening like culture. They started rating this um, for businesses um, not long ago. And, y'all, I'm telling you, check this out. It's true. Y'all, let, let me tell you. And, and I'm just going, again, y'all fire me. Fastest, one of the fastest growing churches ever known in the United States of America is in Birmingham, Alabama. Y'all might know what its name is. Thank you. You know what their net promoter score is? Highest ever known to a church. that has been tested. 82%. Highest more than, what does that mean? I come to church, I'm a pagan, I'm like, what the, man, this is crazy. But I, like, I kind of like it. I recommend it. I bring somebody else. They give their money. It grows. It's crazy, y'all. They track it incessantly because they're like, we need to get people to church and give them a different experience. It's crazy. Right here in our city, one of the fastest growing entities ever. Financial management, y'all know this. You know the, the data science around this. Y'all, can I tell you something? And I, didn't, I want to hear this more. You said it was kind of this, are we finance, like the guy said, or are we, what did he say, are we data science, IT? The language of business is finance. You're only as good, Nick Saban says this, as your record says you are. In business, it's fine. Y'all, the virgin territory to do data science on financials against cohorts, it's unbelievable. Everybody that's done, everybody's like, oh, everybody's doing that. No, you know, the only people really doing it, the only discipline, traders for public companies. I want to build a private cohort of pest control companies, of restaurants in this category, and compare all these numbers, I believe you could build a derivative ticker symbol. So nobody is doing deep, hardcore financial data analysis with small private companies. It is virgin territory. I believe you could even build a market. There's some people out there say you could build a market if you rated everybody by these health signals. So. Um, I'm going to tell you, I think that's coming. Operational scalability. To know if you're worth money, you have to prove operational scale. Anybody know what that means? We talked about it a little bit. It means you can increase your gross margin over time. The more I grow, my gross margin, the bigger I get, was 30%. Now it's going to go to 32% because I have to hire less people. If you can prove that, you are like Dollar Shave Club. People say, why does Dollar Shave Club trade for so much four years ago? Because their ability to grow margins. Why is Amazon the most 
profitable company in the world now. They didn't make money forever, but they always knew. Why do investors always invest, always invest in it? They knew the day, the day Jeffrey Bezos decided to sell toasters, that he could sell his toaster for 13% less than Walmart. The day. Because of his operating skill, the way he didn't have bricks and mortar, he, the way his distribution worked. They knew it. Wall Street knew it. So therefore, they valued him at a fortune before he ever made a dime because they knew the day he did it. That's called operating skill, and that shows up. Is that legal? Not an issue, but listen. How many of y'all, does anybody here ever done pattern recognition around legal documents and depositions? Okay. Huge market right now to determine the risk. It's just like the insurance do to underwrite a life. They're underwriting the probability of a company um, to get sued. And the insurance companies are unbelievable at this. The investors now are getting very, very good at it. Um, having an executive summary and then um, the exit strategy is not data. So somebody asked, what are the top numbers that anybody in my business that's an expert witness of a fairness opinion of what a company's worth, gross margin is number one against your cohort. Try, it pushes stock prices in public. That's number one. Number two is net promoter score. Numbers, numbers, math. Number three is retention. If you get customers and you lose them faster, if your policies, your life insurance, term life policies turn faster than the average, you're going to get hammered. You've got to be able to keep your customers. Otherwise, you're not a good company. Your mix of revenue streams, recurring, reoccurring, and um, one time. Um, the other one I sent you, Nick, what was the other one I sent you? Somebody asked that. Gross margin, EBITDA margin, net promoter score, KPIs relative to your cohorts, retention relative to your cohorts, recurring revenue patterns, oh, usage data. Um, do you know the direct correlation, and we don't see this much in, in data, um, value of a company to how used your product is. And that sounds stupid. What are some products, and like life insurance is an anomaly, insurance anomaly, because I never, you want to use it, don't use it, I'll pay my premiums, scared not to have it, but I don't even want to use it. Every other industry is a direct correlation to how much you use the product or service and how valuable that is. Because if I'm using, why is an ERP system so valuable in evaluation of software? Because the second you, they use it every day. They can't live without it. You know, um, so whatever you're doing, usage, data, patterns, or everything. And then, from y'all's standpoint, um, where, where are y'all with um, un, unsupervised learning? Are you doing much in this world that you're in, Nick, and this group? I mean, you look at data, you're making data science decisions. Are y'all doing much unsupervised learning to where you look at data sets and you find nuggets? Is that something y'all discuss here? Okay, well that is so common. We're seeing, 15 years ago, I couldn't get that from SPS and, you know, um, uh, Good Night, what's Good Night's company's called? SPS and SPSS. You couldn't get it from the basic um, um, quanti quantitative analytics companies, but now the unsupervised learning, y'all, it is so real. It's so beautiful. Once you can define the, you can, you can get a large enough data set and y'all know this, it is so beautiful. It's scary, though, of how you can tune a business based on these 17 things. These aren't mine. These are ones that I watch due diligence every day. You can pour these things, and then it's all about the relationship. So what I'm looking for data science to do for me is to show relationships. How does gross margin relate to customer retention? How does employee retention relate to um, de uh, defensible modes? So I was very curious um, what y'all are doing with unsupervised learning because you give me a data set. So are, are y'all, uh, and healthcare, of course, is used like crazy. Okay. Um, what's the most important tool? I'm assuming it's Excel because I looked at your topics. That's, that's y'all's tool of choice. Okay, yeah, well, you're, yeah, you, yeah. 
So you're even writing some pretty interesting macros and code in that. Um, okay, so I'm going to shut up. Um, I, I, I worry, and Nick said, Zane, this is a C-suite kind of topic because people really want to know what their company's worth. But I, I wanted to encourage you all the value that you bring. Because I'm not saying it's ugly, but most of the owners of these private companies, they just don't have the skill set on their team. My typical companies, 50, 100 employees, they don't have the skill set. And what I would really, and maybe I, this is a, I'm not say I'm not selfish, but I have a healthy self-interest. I would like for data science to move into the private company consulting role to help entrepreneurs know you this is red dude I mean this and lady this is red there's yellow green red you are so on the verge I can predict your culture just turned south because of what's happening with your retention your sick days I can predict it it's just time series prediction right I want your world that's in healthcare and insurance and finance to come to the private market because I think, and again, I see an economic opportunity because of the, of the value it would be to, to business owners. I think they'd pay you a fortune. Our firm underwrites to go to market, but we can't be consultants. So any thoughts on this? Is this like so shallow? I mean, it just means mil tens of millions of dollars to small companies, but um, what's your, what you're thinking? It is, yep. Decisions. So I can ask questions. I love it. And I love that question, and I mean this because I'm the other side. Okay, I was a software engineer, but not at Charles' level. I believe the language of business is fairly simple compared to what y'all do. So I would say that if you had a day or two, you're going to go, no way, to really look at this domain, look at some of the models people have put together, you're going to get it like that. You're going to understand gross margin that means they're doing more with less and doing it better, okay? You're going you're gonna to get it, and then you're going to be able to look at this problem like traditional financial people have never looked at it. I believe that. And let me tell you, our analysts, let me tell you how we hire in Birmingham, Alabama. We found out the number one predictor for a good analyst, and we read lots, a lot of investment banking studies. You know what the number one trait of a great, because we tested them all that were really good. You went back and said, what was their number one trait? There was 400 characteristics, you know. Did they play instruments in high school? That was a big driver. You know, it really was. You know, the number one driver we found and that we used to hire people like, what'd you do? Yeah. Guess. Yeah, so guess. Continuous learning. Curiosity. Intellectual curiosity, because now guess what? You can learn. If you're curious, you're going to learn it. You're going to go home and learn it. That's, that's, that's crazy. Y'all got the number one deal. Now, let me give you the smart side of it. So if you're intellectually can curious. Add, can I add to that? Yeah, that, that's it. Identify pain points and creative solutions. Okay. That, that, is, that is the, y'all, it's intellectual curiosity. That's the word we use because we know you're going to go learn it on your own. You, you can learn this in 48 hours. One time. But y'all, can I tell you, Warren Averett 
does taxes. They can't help these. They're they doing. Don't know what you're talking about. They don't know what you're talking about. Because right, they've never been on the. I need a check. I need. Recurring, but not recurring. They're just reporting for taxes, not enterprise value. Get this. To get to Thank you, Nick. Revenue has to be categorized. Has to be, and they don't even know that. They treat it all. Every, uh, what, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the large, what's, uh, what's this business going to trade out of revenue? What are you talking about? It's all the different revenue streams. You're going to learn this. Here's the number one thing. Intellectual curiosity is the number one thing you're looking for because they can learn nowadays anything online. Go to anything. Number two is your native intelligence. Y'all got us there, y'all. Y'all smart. And guess how we test that for an, an a business analyst? Your your score of your math section of the SAT. That's it. I can't tell this to the lawyers. When you come in, we gonna know. I don't care what you made on English. I wanna know what you made on math. If you've got that native ability, and you're intellectually curious, brother, this is gonna be so easy. And I'm telling you, it doesn't, right now, there's a dearth of talent in this space. And what I'm telling you, little bitty manufacturers and people that own 70 Tzatziki's restaurants, they're dying for this, um, this assessment because it could be worth $10 million, $20 million, if and only if they can prove with the data their business is different. I think... I'm speaking at Sanford when? Friday, Rebecca? I think Friday. That's what I'm telling all the students. I'm like, listen, it's good to have a CPA. It's great to be a software engineer. Please learn the language of business and use your skills to go. Because they're, they're not doing it. Now, they're doing it in insurance. They're doing it in, they're not doing it in private companies. And guess what it could allow you to do? To get the most coveted job in finance. Most coveted is the private equity. Companies that, that, get money from insurance companies and, and uh, high net worth individuals and they go invest it in private companies, inefficient companies. What if you could identify because of all this pattern recognition around those 17 things, you could really test a culture, really test gross margin, and you could go buy companies way under value, immediately turn around and sell them. That's what private, that's, private equity will pay you a fortune if you can build some of these, that's what the net purse motor score was, but it was only for, you know, how fast is the company going to grow? Well, I, I have, I have, I have analysts that turn, their data that turn into associates that turn into VPs, but, but they came from most of them the finance world. I would like for y'all with fresh eyes to look at what we're doing. That's why I told Nick, if y'all ever want one of our uh, associates or answers all day, every day, try to model this. But it's, it's shallow into the pool. Compared. I would like, you, you get started with a private equity group, a VC fund or somebody like us, and, and you, you play around with it. And then you say, wait a second. Well, it's I'm just job it's on job learning. Just play play with the data set, and we give you a data set of a company. Here's their payroll. Here's their retention. Here's their sick day, and you maybe could find these other little tidbits that are worth a fortune. It's just okay, as an investor in a VC and a investment banker, you know the market's so efficient nowadays. It's hard to make money. A lot of little companies come and show me stuff. I'm like, you got no barrier to interest. Everybody can build that code in the United States of America. It's whoever can sell it. And the big companies, once, once you pave the way, they're just going to flatten you because they can build that code. They're going to charge nothing until you go out of business. It's, it's really, really odd. People say, oh, look at these companies that started like shit. Man, that, that is so odd. It's so unusual. I can give you thousands of companies to Shagan and Bill that go broke. They put 10 million in their own money. They save. They use their house money, and they go broke because it's very difficult. When I see something that's inefficient, that's where the money is. What I just showed y'all in the data science world, or just I'm just giving you the basic things. We just nobody's doing it for private companies. 
They're doing it as traders, hedge fund, people for public companies because they have all the data. Public company, all this data is kind of teed up and everybody says, oh, that's the data. Private companies, you've got you to get in there and figure out how to get it. So I, th I think it's just getting around people that invest and having a new set of glasses and building some models. And then at the end of the day, people will pay you a lot of money to, to do this. Because, see, I, I see any place there's a lot of people doing stuff, it's hard to differentiate yourself. There's a lot of noise. I don't know how to differentiate one data scientist from another. I have no clue. But if you show me some models that could bring this stuff out, how they use an IP, how likely is their patent to get, you know, reused? So anyway, great questions. I'm, I'm telling you, y'all have got it. Don't ever let anybody tell you because you're not a subject matter expert in business that you couldn't figure this out fast. It's, it's pretty shallow into the pool compared to the stuff y'all have done. Um, so I'm looking to get y'all more in, in business. And, and, and the money's there. I don't know if you're money motivated. I mean, are, 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 are y'all money motivated? Eat, so. and, and the way to do this is through, is through tech and wonderful data sets and databases, which y'all understand. Make the database run faster, okay? That's a competitive advantage to get data faster. Again, I, 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 I would love to show you this with our Excel guys and girls that are absolutely just uh, geniuses. I know this is the softer side, but love you to think about it. And if there was one of these items you think you could grade, like a sales funnel, if you figured out how to build a gold key, to say, I will come in and I do an assessment on your sales funnel against your cohort, game over. There's not a CEO I know that wouldn't pay you to come and assess the velocity of their sales funnel against their cohort with real data. I mean, I've never heard of anybody offer that. So, all right, I've talked too much. Y'all are very kind. Thank you on a late rainy night to... Listen to some crazy dude. Nick, was that is there anything in there that's helpful or useful? <laughs>